Good morning, Grace. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 27 this morning. So let's have a word of prayer and then let's get into the text. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. God, I, um, I, I pray for everyone listening, for everyone who will listen, um, that you would give understanding, uh, that you would give insight, that you would give the ability to obey and to apply uh, what we learned today. Father, I pray that you would teach us. Um, I pray that uh, mm-hmm. that your word, uh, that I, you would help me to, to explain your word clearly, um, concisely, uh, and uh, and logically and, and, and just in a clear way so that people can understand. Father, you are the one who gives understanding. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I, just, I just ask that you would give clarity today uh, and that you'd help us all to understand and apply your word to your glory. Um, I also pray that you might reveal um, uh, your word today to those who, who previously have not submitted to Jesus Christ. Um, God, I know that your word always accomplishes that which uh, that purpose which you send it out uh, to accomplish. So I thank you for that uh, and to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and read this next section. Uh, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed it amongst them, among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. Then he said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Uh, I particularly like this story uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, The main one is that uh, Jesus says, I'm not going to answer your question. Or he says, I'm not going to tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. But actually, Jesus reveals a whole lot uh, in this in this section, and he does reveal the answer to this question, even though, true to his word, he doesn't tell them directly, or at least communicate to them in a way that they comprehend, that they accept, uh, he doesn't answer their question in that sense. Um, so I wanted to make one uh, a quick observation about this particular section, um, because we find this um, we find this order of events. And with the parables following, or at least um, with the parable of the tenants following, uh, in all three Gospels, we find it in Matthew uh, 21, we find it in Luke chapter 20, and in Mark chapter 11. Um, So I think we we see the same thing. We see the triumphal entry, we see Jesus clear the temple, uh, and um, I don't remember if we see the fig tree in every every account, but then we see the authority of Jesus questioned, and then we see that Jesus tells the parable of the tenants after. Matthew includes the parable of the two sons before the parable of the tenants, but in all three accounts, that's the order. Um, I would argue that it is through the parable of the tenants that Jesus actually reveals the answer to their question. Although, like I already said, he doesn't tell them uh, in a direct way where they understand what he's saying. So uh, I wanted to look at the things that Jesus does reveal uh, through this particular section, um, because even though he doesn't directly answer them uh, with, a, with a, se- a clear, simple statement, he does reveal a whole lot um, to us, and, and Matthew helps us to see that. Now, the first thing that Matthew helps us to see that Jesus reveals um, is, the, is that he reveals the willful stupidity of people uh, who reject him. And I think that's really important, um, willful stupidity. Uh, there is uh, there's certainly an excuse for ignorance. Paul talks about, at, at some points, his own ignorance, uh, his own lack of knowledge. Um, but willful stupidity uh, is different, and this is kind of my own definition, so it's not, you know, I'm not trying to make any, any wider claims about the English language, but willful stupidity is a person who witnesses the truth, who sees the truth, and then rejects the truth. 
That is willful stupidity. Someone who knows the truth, who's seen evidence of the truth, and rejects the truth. How does Jesus reveal that? Well, uh, keep in mind, the same order of events is happening. Who is it who's asking the question here? The, the chief priests and the elders of the people. They have at least, they have at very least, heard the testimony of the things that Jesus has been doing for the last several years. They've at least heard the testimony. And they have witnessed some of the things that Jesus has done. They've witnessed the triumphal entry. They've heard about what happened, uh, how people replied and responded to Jesus entering in. They heard that praise. Um, and, and Matthew tells us here, uh, as the teachers of the people, as the uh, elders of the people, the chief priests, they would have been present in the temple when Jesus cleared the temple. So uh, again, all of that is, it's in all three accounts that they cleared the temple, or that Jesus cleared the temple. So these guys, um, they know that Jesus cleared the temple, and they know that Jesus called this place um, uh, his father's house. And they know, uh, Matthew tells us here uh, in verse 14, that Jesus was healing people in the temple. So Jesus is teaching people in the temple, healing people in the temple, and he claims some sort of authority over the temple in clearing it out. Uh, so these guys, when they ask, by what authority are you doing these things, they already have witnessed the truth, and they've already rejected the truth. So Jesus reveals, and Matthew helps us to see this, Jesus reveals the willful stupidity of people who bear witness to the truth and yet reject the truth, or feign ignorance of the truth, which is what the, the, the chief priests and the elders of the people do here. Now secondly, uh, Jesus reveals to us um, Jesus reveals to us his identity and authority uh, in two ways, one through the Word of God and one through his miracles. So firstly, through the Word of God, the presence of Jesus already in the temple, in this situation, having claimed authority, having taught in the temple, he's already he's fulfilling prophecy. Um, just want to remind you briefly of Malachi, the book of Malachi, where, um, where in chapter 3 we see the coming of a messenger before the coming of the Lord. And also this is referred to in Isaiah, but I, li I like the, uh, the Malachi passage just because I can be really succinct and stick in one verse. Um, we see a, the coming of a messenger who's going to announce the way for the Lord and prepare the way before him. And then we see the Lord that they seek, the Messiah, coming suddenly into his temple. The messenger of the covenant, which you, who you desire, says the Lord Almighty. Um, so through his word, Jesus reveals his identity. That is, as we see Jesus fulfilling prophecy, as he promised in his word beforehand, we see who Jesus is. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we could go to a ton of places here. We could go to Ezekiel, where Jesus talks about, um, uh, where God talks about specifically to the, the shepherds of Israel, to the teachers, um, that their failure to do the job that he assigned them will ultimately result in him coming to do that job himself, him coming to be the good shepherd. And he talks about how he's going to teach the people, how he's going to bind them up, how he's going to um, uh, really go after the lost ones and return them to himself. Uh, so all of what Jesus has done up to this point in his ministry has all been foretold in the Old Testament. So Jesus reveals himself through his word. Now secondly, Jesus reveals himself through his, uh, through his miracles. Um, I want to go just real quickly to a couple places in, in the book of John. In John chapter 9, in verse 30, I'm just going to read verse 30 through 33. But the scene is, right, we have the man born blind, who has been brought in several times for questioning by the Pharisees regarding his healing. And uh, later on in chapter 9, uh, after the second uh, of these investigations, the Pharisees, they say, well, we know... Uh, we know where Moses came from, but we don't know where this man came from. We don't, we don't even know where he comes from, they say in verse 29. This man, who had been born blind and been healed, answers, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, 
He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So even, it, it's so awesome to me how John, in a, in a really ironic way, shows how the guy who was born blind is the only one to see the truth of who Jesus is. And, and but, but the man reveals in, in this wonderful way, he's like, God shows that this guy is from him when, when he does these miracles. Because God would never authorize these miracles that this guy is doing, that this Jesus is doing, if he weren't originally from God. There's no way. And then in John 10, 25, we see Jesus talking about the same thing. In verse, yeah, verse 25, he says, I tell you, you do not believe. I tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe me. Really important. Jesus reveals who he is through his miracles. And remember, uh, like we already saw as Jesus was revealing the, the willful stupidity of the people who rejected him, who saw that they saw the truth. They heard the truth, and they saw the witness of the Father in the miracles that Jesus has done and in the actions he's done. Uh, so the next thing that we see is that Jesus reveals the hypocrisy of men. It's not really the, the chronological next thing, but I want to save the, the chronological next thing for last. Um, the, the, the other thing that Jesus reveals is the hypocrisy of men, specifically the religious people who reject him um, uh, on their on religious grounds or on religious pretense. He, sp he reveals hypocrisy, specifically the hypocrisy of the religious. Now, how does he do that? Well, uh, when we see the discussion of the people, and Jesus is going to remark on this later in the parable of the two sons, he, they say, uh, if we say from heaven, he'll ask, why didn't you believe? And if we say from men, we're afraid of the people. So, so really, Matthew helps us to see this, but Jesus is going to comment on it in the parable of the two sons. These guys show that even though they're religious, they're teachers of the law, they're chief priests, they're big shots in the temple, and they're supposed to be big shots with the people, they're supposed to know the word of God. I mean, they teach it. And yet, they show, and Matthew helps us to see this, that they fear men more than God. What a disaster that is when people fear men more than God. Because even if they know what the Word of God says, even if they understand what the Word of God says, they ultimately choose uh, self-preservation, and they ultimately choose um, their, their, their appearance in the eyes of people over how God, um, how God uh, uh, feels about them, you know, so to speak. So um, he says uh, here, um, Matthew tells us here, that they were more afraid of people, and they were more careful about their own position than they were about how God would respond to their uh, rejection of his word. So God's made it absolutely clear, and these guys know it. They know that God made it absolutely clear who Jesus is. But they fear the people. And they don't want Jesus to remark on their hypocrisy in front of everybody. They know if they admit that it was from that, that John's baptism, uh, which was a baptism of repentance, not just he's talking about the baptism itself, but all of John's teaching about uh, the baptism. And remember, John called people to repent from their sins. He told them, the kingdom of heaven is near. You need to repent from your sins, and you need to believe in the one who's coming after me. So Jesus is, is upholding the same thing here when he says, uh, what about John's baptism? What do you think about that, guys? What, what did you think about that? Was it from heaven or was it from men? Because if it's from heaven, they needed to obey it. They needed to recognize it, they needed to obey it, and they needed to, you know, in responding to it. That is, they needed to turn from their sin, and they needed to be ready to accept the one who was coming after. He's going to reveal it again in the next section that they neither accepted that they were sinners and needed to repent, which was John's teaching uh, and, and his call to baptism, and they did not uh, prepare themselves to accept the one who was coming after, Jesus. And so we find him he, them here, uh, having uh, rejected the idea that they needed to repent, 
they're also rejecting the one who is coming after. And that brings us to the final thing uh, that Jesus reveals. So Jesus reveals his identity through his miracles and through the Word of God, all of the Word of God. Uh, Jesus reveals um, himself through uh, confession and repent. Um, sorry, he reveals the hypocrisy of men who reject him. He reveals the willful stupidity of men who reject him. And then finally, he reveals himself, his identity, and his authority through the confession and repentance of people who accept him. Now, uh, the confession and the repentance, uh, this is what I, I believe Jesus and Matthew are specifically highlighting for us here in the question that Jesus asks. Because as we think back on what John the Baptist told people, that the kingdom of heaven is, is near, it's approaching, you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin, and you need to believe in the one who's coming after me. As we read, uh, as we read about it, and we see the the chief priests and the scribes and the teachers, all these guys who rejected who Jesus was, even though he revealed himself in his miracles and in his teaching, um, as we see uh, these guys rejecting, we see Jesus revealing the truth. Um, that through repentance and that through uh, uh, trust in Jesus, through um, faith in, in, in the biblical claims about Jesus Christ, uh, a person can have the truth of himself, uh, that is, the truth of Christ himself, revealed to him. Well, uh, we see this every single day, don't we? As we as we share the truth of, of God with uh, Muslims in this particular area, but also Catholics, also other people who who tend to reject, um, uh, even though Catholics reject the uh, uh, accept the identity of Jesus Christ, they don't actually act on um, uh, the 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 identity of Jesus Christ. They might make a verbal repentance, but they don't actually make a an actual repentance and a decision to actually follow Jesus. So, um, regardless, all the people who reject what God has revealed about Jesus Christ in the Scripture, through his miracles, through his teachings, through his death and his resurrection, uh, when people reject that, uh, they will not know who he is, and they question and they pick apart anything they can uh, that they've heard about about Jesus Christ. They'll try to point out contradictions in the Scripture. They clearly do not know who Jesus Christ is. And yet, their, their rejection of him does not take away at all from our understanding, from our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I experienced this, and I'm sure you have too, even as early Christians, even if you can't explain every question that somebody comes to you with about the Scripture, your faith itself does not diminish if you have truly trusted in Jesus Christ. Because your faith is actually something really, really small. It's, it's, in the beginning, your faith is something that is actually built on, one, a confession of your own sinfulness, and two, your need for a Savior. Uh, three, that Jesus Christ is that Savior. Um, you might word it differently than I have, but those three things are absolutely essential. One, you're a sinner. You need to confess, and that's what John the Baptist uh, came preaching. You guys are wicked. You need to confess your sin. Uh, number two that you need somebody to save you, that you can't actually do it yourself. Again, right back to what uh, John the Baptist taught. There's somebody coming after me. I'm baptizing you in water uh, for repentance, but there's somebody coming after who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's actually going to give you the ability uh, to do what God has said. Remember thinking back on what Ezekiel told us the Holy Spirit would do uh, in Ezekiel chapter 36, I believe. Uh, and then also the idea of fire, the understanding of actually changing who you are. We'll talk about, we could talk about fire later, but I'm not going to go into it right now. But one thing that fire does is it actually changes the essence. It changes what things are. When fire encounters something, a chemical change happens. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit actually comes into your life, a real change occurs. And so what Jesus reveals to us here that is, I, I would say, most important, is that through confession in what John taught, which is that we are sinners and we need to repent, 
and in con through confession and, and faith in the one that John said is coming after, the one that we really need to believe in, the one that we need to watch for, the one that we need to listen to, who is Jesus Christ. And so by confession of our sinfulness and by uh, trust in Jesus Christ, we understand who Jesus is. And like Jesus promised the disciples, our faith can't be shaken because our faith results in a real, uh, a real change that God makes happen through the presence, uh, through the gifting of the Holy Spirit. That is the giving of the Holy Spirit to the believer. And, and the Holy Spirit begins to work in that person's life and affect real change. So I would caution you this morning. Jesus reveals, he reveals the willful stupidity of people who reject him. He reveals his identity and his authority through both his miracles and through the teachings of the scripture. He reveals through conf on an individual basis through confession of the sinfulness, uh, of, of the individual's sinfulness, through repentance from that sinfulness, and a turning in faith to Jesus Christ. Uh, and then he reveals that on an individual level where it's not going to be shaken. Jesus also reveals the hypocrisy of people who reject him, even people who reject him on a, on a religious basis. So I would caution you this morning, if you are rejecting Jesus Christ, any part of what we talked about, if you're rejecting the fact that you're a sinner, if you're rejecting the fact, uh, the fact that only through the, the, the perfect life, the sacrificial death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ can you actually be reconciled to God. If you're reconciling that in any, or if you're ref, uh, refusing that in any part, if you're re refusing to acknowledge the truth of that in any part, you're in that group of people. Uh, you're in that group of, of hypocritical people, or uh, hi um, hypocrites, who are willfully rejecting and showing themselves to be willfully stupid in regards to who Jesus Christ is. You're rejecting the forgiveness of God. Um, so Jesus Christ reveals who he is, regardless of whether you want to accept it or not. But if you have accepted it, um, please continually, continually have that attitude of confession uh, to God's word, that it is always right God's word is always right, and we are always wrong. If there's ever a situation where we look at God's word and we see um, something that we, we don't really want to accept, we need to remember that God is always right, we're always wrong. And it's through confession and repentance and trust in Christ that we can be brought closer and closer um, uh, to who God is and understanding who he is. Uh, and we can be brought closer and closer uh, to him in likeness of Christ. Um, so let's pray. Uh, let's confess the truth of God's word. And let's ask him to help us to obey it, to respond appropriately to it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for revealing the truth of Jesus Christ uh, to all those who have accepted him. God, I pray that you would continue to reveal yourself and reveal the truth of Jesus Christ um, even to people who right now are rejecting him. You know, I know that, that, that everybody whose faith is not in Jesus Christ at this moment is at this moment an enemy of you and rejecting uh, the salvation that you offer through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would overcome people's willful stupidity, willful rejection, willful ignorance, and that you would reveal uh, in your grace and in your mercy who Jesus Christ is, that you would save people. God, thank you so much. I also ask that you would help your church to consider the truth of your word in all things, that you would be constantly making us more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, and that that would, res that would uh, result in your glory. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Grace, have a great day.